Well, hello. I'm Sky. I'm from Santa Cruz, California originally. I used to live in Watsonville, California over 13 years. I've been with Keith almost three years and a half, off and off. I'm very, very blessed that Keith has this organization to be feeding people. And I would vouch for Keith anytime, and my family would vouch for Keith because my mom used to be a social worker for the campment of Davenport at their resource center. So I'm trying to follow my mom's steps, and I really encourage everybody, please sign a petition for Keith that he wants to feed these people. He gives up for his family. I give up my family to do this as a volunteer because I love homeless people. I don't see homeless people like homeless people. I see them like family to me. They're all my brothers and sisters. I have had my ups and downs recently. Two weeks ago here, I collapsed. And one of the homeless persons caught me. And he's my guardian angel. And since then, I've been coming back. And I want to keep coming back. And I hope in more and more years that I will travel and I get to see more food not bombs everywhere else. The food not bombs originally where I first met Keith, it was at the post office by Pacific Avenue on Walnut. Now I'm here at the town clock. I've been here off and off with him over two months again. And then I was with him by Laurel then. But now we're here and we're hoping we stay here. And I hope everybody comes and eats a wonderful warm meal today and enjoy themselves. Many blessings to all the homeless people and I hope one day they get their home. My wish is if one day I get my home, I will give them a home. I will get mental health doctors there. And I would insist more rehabs for people that have a drug addictions, alcohol addictions, any addictions. I want to be there for them that I could help them out. And that's my big dream one day. If I ever win the lotto, I would give it to the homeless society before me. And then at the end, whatever's left over, I would give it to the poor kids in Mexico. That's it for now. Gracias. Hi, I'm Keith McHenry and I'm one of the original eight kids that started Food Not Bombs in Boston, Massachusetts in 1980 at, uh, after a Seabrook protest on May 24th. Welcome to the town clock in Santa Cruz, California. Two years ago to, on uh, the 14th of March, technically speaking, um, we moved to the town clock and we because we heard that morning that the coffee house at the um, Red Church was going to shut down because of the pandemic. St. Francis was shutting down. The senior meal at Loud Nelson was shutting down because of lockdown. So we go, okay, well, we'll just do it every day until the lockdown's over. And now it's two years later, we're still doing it because <laughs> the lockdown essentially never really, I mean, it's been modified many times, but those soup kitchens never reopened. So, you know, we became the only food, the only drinking water. For the first hundred days, roughly, we were the only fresh water unless you went to CVS to buy it. Because there was no, you know, the, they closed the bathroom. So you couldn't get any water, even in a restaurant bathroom, you couldn't get in. So anyway, we were out here. I was here every day. I was outside every day for the first hundred days without fail. And then I was like, almost the entire 730 days I've been outside with people, you know, doing food. With a few exceptions of being sick and or you know being out of town. How many times did they move you around from place to place? The Sentinel said it was eight times, but that probably misses the two county ones where we got evicted from the county. It also uh, probably does not include the being flooded out of the benchlands when we finally like went to the benchlands within. A week we were flooded out and lost our equipment and then moved back to, so it, it could be nearly a dozen times that we were evicted during this whole time. We've actually been evicted from here, but we ignored them and we just continued to be at the, at the town clock and, you know, what are they going to do? We're, we're the only food, so if, they, right. you know. yeah, if it wasn't for you, how many folks wouldn't have been served? Oh God, it was been like thousands of people because we've been doing the, the meals, we've been bringing the food to the Benchlands, which might be as, at the height of it sometimes, 400 people. Then we've got 200 meals here every day. Uh, these are different than the Benchlands people um, because a lot of the Benchlands people don't come here because they're, they want, have to guard their stuff at their camp. And then we also have a whole bu bunch of families, undocumented workers that we provide food for. And for a long time we were doing the food for the uh, Live Oak uh, School District, providing them with the bulk food. So we, uh, we then, the when the fire happened, 
we were just swamped with new people that were coming in who lost their houses in the fire and all their clothing and everything. So our clothing became the thing that they the, they most needed. So it's been an amazing, uh, you know, with a fire, a pandemic, uh, the housing foreclosure crisis going out, uh, you know, just totally insane. Massive towing of unhoused people's cars, so they come to us for uh, tents. I just bought uh, another 22 tents this morning because they're on sale, just to make sure I've got tents. Because I had three or four people ask me yesterday for tents, and the day before it was three or four people looking for tents. So that's happening every like, yeah. So, you know, the, so if it wasn't for us out here every day, we, in fact, early on, there was a couple of guys about to break out a window downtown to get food. The volunteer said, hey, we got food at the town clock, just go there. So they came here and didn't break in Oswald's windows out to steal their food. So I don't know what they're doing. Crime prevention. Yeah, so we've been crime prevention. Uh, we've also been the mental health facility for the county, essentially. Now, some people are removed from here, uh, taken to, uh, to mental hospitals, but most, once they're kicked back out, we get them again, and so we've been handling that, and we've gone through a whole transition with people who have actually, at the beginning, it was easy to see how a person that was already having some issues were like way over the top because even the most stable, sane people were freaking out because you had no idea what the pandemic was going to do to us. And so that just amplified the mental health crisis of people that were already really struggling. And then, you know, so we've handled that the entire time as well. It's just the families that lose their housing and we help them out, you know. So it's a gamut of children to, you know, senior citizens who are living on, who had cars, who lost them to the police, who then live in tents that we hand them to live at the bench lines. Seems like a... Just a roller coaster all the way down. Yeah, so I mean, it's incredible. Now, the thing that blows my mind about the two years is it's been all volunteer. We've had to adjust, like, not only from the evictions, but we had to adjust for different conditions all the time. So, we ended up buying uh, two ship containers and uh, partially to one of them just to store food because we believe and still believed and still believe that the economic crisis is going to get so severe that will be similar to either the Great Depression or much worse. And we can see signs of that already happening. So we've been trying to bulk up for fear that there can be food shortages. There already has been bumps in food, uh, access to food, because of like what they call supply, you know, supply chain disruptions, or now they're blaming on Russia. You know, it'll be like, it's an endless array of, of chaos in this regard. Then we're seeing like with the, so we, with the gas prices just going up, that is massive taxation against poor people. And so people won't, are already reporting they can't get to work. They can't, uh, you know, so people are losing their jobs like that. It's like unbelievable, the whole thing. So we are just completely, um, you know, preparing for that. We bought water filtration systems in case there's power outages during this thing. We bought a generator in case we got to start with a ton, lots and lots of propane tanks to cook food in case we have disruptions with kitchens, with access to water. So we have been thinking on this idea that we will be the people here responding to the, the whatever crisis is happening. And so then we have probably, I would say, about half the people that work, volunteer with us are live outside. So for instance, the main people setting up the tents and everything live outside. Um, so we, so we, uh, um, have, we have a team that includes unhoused people that do the composting and distribution of the um, uh, recycling cardboard. We have another team that does uh, picks up the the food from like Trader Joe's, from Second Harvest, and from um, you know for all that. Um, then we have other teams that come out and serve the food. We have teams that wash all the pots and hotel trays and everything. We have teams that cook. So there's all this infrastructure of volunteers in this schedule that we are figured out that just goes like all day long every day without with seamlessly even with the crises that happen like a broken down vehicle they have to fix it up and things like that um, then 
we also have all the support amongst the, the general population, much bigger than the little noisy anti-homeless people that like harass a city council into trying to kick us out of here, for example, and spread misinformation about it. Like they say, oh, it's all dirty and horrible and the people are dangerous, you can't go to, can't use the, you know, the uh, town clock anymore, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turned out the people that were using the town clock were three of our friends, uh, Sea Otter, <laughs> Drew and Tony, and they still are here. They're still enjoying it because now they have free food that arrives every day rather than them sitting here and having to walk to Lot 27 or someplace to get the meal. So those were the people that were whose lives were going to be disrupted by us being here according to the city council and the city attorney's office. So, um, but then as you watch through the day, you already have seen um, at least one person come by to bring us food because they read about us in the Sentinel this morning. And then this happens all day long. People from all over the community dropping off clothing, coming by giving us a $20 bill. Um, there's this massive silent majority of Santa Cruz that's 100% behind what we're doing. And, and they aren't on, you know, nextdoor.com smearing people. They're not like, it, um, you know, in uh, Santa Cruz neighbors or Take Back Santa Cruz are these groups trying to, you know, or uh, See Bright Strong and all this stuff that are astroturf groups started by like uh, corporations have like real estate interests in the community, that kind of thing. So that's really the main story, I think, is how much support we have from all these organizations and people, random people. Um, for a long time, we were the only place for a person to volunteer to work off their hours for court referral. So we, we were that. We, we, we were the only, uh, you know, uh, the volunteer center had no place to send people. They sent them to us because we needed volunteers every day. So we've had this amazing cross-section of unhoused people, people that needed to work their hours for court, you know, retired people that just want to help out, college students from both Cabrillo and from uh, UCSC. Um, it's this amazing mixture of communities all getting together to make sure this happens. And then the other thing that's remarkable is that we're here, you know, the monument here is called Collateral Damage, and it's uh, melted down guns, and it's a protest against war. Well, what is more important than protesting war right now with a group called Food Not Bombs who's been saying that this 70, $700 billion a year budget should just not be spent on bombs when HUD says that for $40 billion you could end homelessness in the United States. And that's the same government that's been controlled by the Democrats now for two years that never came up with any solutions for any of these things. They don't even have legislative proposals for any of this uh, and they you know they're just like well it's dead let's have a war you know that's which they did not need to have they could have signed an agreement and and I'm not saying that Russia is great we've lost a number in fact a person born in Chernobyl who was living in St. Petersburg doing food not bombs to more was stabbed to death by Russian Nazis so every side of this conflict has got is funding Nazis that's no secret. And um, why the U.S. is dumping dangerous weapons into a, a, a theater that they created with their coup and everything to and now supplying Javelin missiles to neo-Nazi military units. We've got to be saying no to this whole war. And we need a big, huge protest in the U.S. against the war. And we don't need these protests where they're like, you know, clear the sky protests like happened last week where people came out and called for nuclear war at the peace protest. That should not be happening and that is frightening. And, we, and then also the level of censorship online is unbelievable. It's, it's not, you know, now basically opposition to the Biden administration and the Pentagon's uh, policies is forbidden and is erased. And, and, and I can't believe anybody supports that idea. And then this whole mad rush to, like, if you, you know, there was a Ukrainian restaurant just got shut down because they called themselves the Russian restaurant. Because they thought more people would go to their restaurant if they could know what he knew what Ukraine was. But it was a Ukrainian family just had a restaurant shut down because 
it said Russian. And that, it, it, the, the xenophobia. But meanwhile, we're spending billions on bombing Yemen and Somalia and, and, and all these other countries. We killed like over a million people in Iraq. Like, where do we got the moral uh, ability to say that Hitler's okay? I mean, that's the other thing. Now, now Hitler's okay because Putin is so bad? That's hardcore. You have like leaders of our country like praising Hitler and saying he's not as bad as Putin. Unbelievable. And that's probably because we have been funding for two, since 2014 neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Maybe probably before that. And this wider war, this is like could go world war. I mean the US government posted on Facebook a meme about nuclear explosions saying you could survive a nuclear war. And if you go to ready.gov nuclear, the first paragraph tells you you can survive a nuclear war. Why are they putting that out at this time? Unbelievable. And now the whole COVID, now it turns out Pfizer lied to everybody about stuff. So that's not in the news now because we've got a war in Ukraine. But they're going to they're gonna go bankrupt at this point. They're going to be totally go down. And that's why the president CEO of Moderna sold all of his stock and deleted his Twitter account probably knowing that once the data was released that it was more dangerous to get injected than to not. What was the point of all this chaos for two years that we survived? You know, and I've been out, like I said, I've been out here the whole time and we've been defying essentially the because out of necessity, because these people, you know, we have friends that came up and showed us tickets that they were violating the uh, stay at home order and their address was transient. Where were they supposed to go? And there's like thousands of us out here that, that had no place to go during the pandemic. They were, we were quarantined together at Food Not Bombs <laughs> or in the Benchlands or whatever, you know? So the reality of what, if you're stuck at home watching TV and listening to the media, you got one reality which is controlled by the authorities and then if you're out here on the streets for 730 days, you have another reality which is completely different, which is a family of people, friends, who are all together in this crazy world of lockdowns and, and propaganda and war and brutality against people living outside. And, and no plans to handle the, you know, there's, uh, the, there's 40 million people facing eviction in the United States. Do you ever read about a plan in the New York Times to house everybody? No, you have hedge funds that are, took all the money from the Pen CARES Pro, uh, Act. Now they have way, billion, trillions of dollars and now they're building luxury condos all over the world, including here in Santa Cruz. And they're buying private homes, paying cash, so you barely, you know, it's really difficult to get a mortgage now. And there's homeowners that buy, ha sell their house at maybe a hundred thousand over their uh, asking price, go to buy another house, they can't buy one because the hedge fund will always pay more, whatever the going, you know, keep up in the, the bid. You can never like get the, get the house. So now those people are becoming renters and many of those people are becoming homeless. The whole thing is psychotic. You know, maybe in closing, the big thing about Food Not Bombs is we started 42 years ago in Cambridge when I was t giving out produce to at a housing project across from a nuclear weapons lab called Draper Lab on Portland Avenue. And we were concerned that there would be a future where there'd be a threat of nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare because that's where the Reagan was talking about putting his our taxes into that and cutting uh, social services. Eight years of Reagan and you had an estimated 700,000 homeless Americans. There was less than 100,000 homeless when he came to office. We, our idea was street theater to try to get the American people to wake up. That your resources are being stolen from you and being given to military contractors like Raytheon and Lockheed and so on, which is what is currently going on. And at the same time, it was good business from their point of view to have wars, which have happened the entire time since Food Not Bombs started, the U.S. has been at war. So, this is the time for Food Not Bombs to shine. We need to really 
you know, we have Ukrainian food not bombs groups, which we can't get a hold of. Hopefully they're alive. Hopefully they're not in prison. We've got the groups in Poland are handling massive refugee crisis right now. We have food not bombs was just arrested in Moscow for holding a banner against the war. Um, so we, we, this is the time for food not bombs globally, since we're in over a thousand cities and we're in every uh, continent except Antarctica, to, to bring people together, like we're trying to do today, to say no, this is we're done paying for war. It's time to, for peace and it's time for everybody to have what they need because we obviously have enough resources if we can pay $770 billion a year to military contractors and to run a huge op military operations which are clearly not making us safer, in fact bringing us to the point of possible nuclear war if what the messaging from the U.S. government is, uh, it turns out to be accurate. So, so we, this is foodnotbomb.net. We've got to get out there. We've got to do whatever we can take to try to turn things around so that war is not going, that all these wars are going to end and that our resources are going to go to making sure we have housing, food, and clothing. Basically, the society is collapsing completely. The government is completely collapsed at in, in all levels. And so the only thing is mutual aid and, and working together on the streets and there's no and and workers at any place that or have food that they can't sell they just want to give it away they can see the hunger they themselves are probably hungry right because they're like working at a minimum wage job in a produce market or bakery or something they completely relate to the fact that this food rather than go out into the dumpster be given to people to eat and that so i there i don't think there's any place even on that i've ever been in any Asia or anywhere where you won't get free food if you if you if they know you're feeding people even poor people in markets in Philippines were like give you food because they were like yeah of course I mean it, and in fact you know the smile on produce workers of in like a little stall in a totally poor place in in, in you know Indonesia or, or what, you know what Africa they were like yeah man this is we want to help out, so yeah, I don't think there's any problem doing that. That's really beautiful.